This is our presentation for tobacco cessation counseling. The learning objectives include, um, at the end of this, at the conclusion of this presentation, students will be able to recognize the health hazards of tobacco use, identify the components of tobacco products, explain the mechanisms of nicotine delivery, and this means the different ways in which people um, use tobacco products, discuss the oral manifestations of tobacco use, describe the effects of environmental tobacco smoke, identify pharmacotherapies and behavioral therapies used to treat nicotine addiction, and then at the end, we're just going to list the host dose protocols for treating patients who smoke tobacco. So what is tobacco? Well, it's a leafy green plant uh, grown around the world, and tobacco use, chiefly in the form of cigarettes, is the leading cause of preventable illness and death in the United States. It's the number one public health problem in the United States, causing more deaths each year than alcohol, car accidents, suicide, homicide, and fires combined. It's a proven risk factor for heart disease, malignant neoplasms, strokes, and uh, accounts for one of every five deaths. All tobacco products uh, emit over 7,000 chemicals, and over about 70 of them have been identified as carcinogens. A carcinogen is a chemical or other substance that causes cancer. And low tar cigarettes actually produce higher levels of certain carcinogenic chemicals such as carbon monoxide. In addition to, over, uh, to all these chemicals is, of course, the um, chemical nicotine, which gives cigarettes their addictive um, nature. Okay? Within 10 seconds, nicotine causes the brain to release adrenaline, creating a buzz of pleasure and energy and tobacco companies use other additives and chemicals to make them even more addictive. Now, while nicotine is not a carcinogen, it is one of the most addictive substances known to, to humankind. It's 10 times more addictive than heroin or cocaine, and six to eight times more addictive than alcohol. And because nine out of 10 smokers start before the age of 18, it is considered a pediatric disease. Tobacco use is considered a pediatric disease. Um, this is an image that I got from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and it's just showing you some of the uh, chemicals that are in a cigarette, and it includes um, uh, carcinogenic substances such as polonium, dibenzacridine, uh, urethane, pyrene, and cadmium. Worldwide, tobacco claims 6 million deaths per year, one of 10 adults annually, and one life every, every eight seconds and about 30% of patients in any given dental practice are current smokers. Where's my other slide? Okay, we're gonna, we have another slide that talks a little bit more about why uh, hygienists should be uh, on the front lines of helping people um, cut their nicotine addiction. Smoking harms nearly every organ of the body, damaging a smoker's overall health even when it doesn't cause a specific illness. It's the number one risk factor for heart disease and stroke, and it's the most significant risk factor in the development and progression of periodontal disease. We also know that it is a major risk factor for oral and pharyngeal cancer. Uh, smoking is known to cause at least 30% of all cases of, pro of cancer and approximately 164,000 deaths per year in the United States. And I've listed some of the cancers uh, on the right side of the slide. It's linked to 90% of cases of lung cancer in males and 78% of lung cancers in females. So the thought that if we eradicate smoking, we could eradicate or at least lower this number of lung cancers, um, you know, kind of just blows your mind. It really, it really does. Smoking is a known cause of at least 25% of all heart disease and strokes and 90% of the uh, COPD cases. And COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, some of the effects uh, of smoking are cardiovascular and lung disease, and what you'll see is that they have what's called a smoker's cough, which is a chronic cough due to the impaired ability of the lungs to clear harmful material. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it happens when excess mucus in the airways. Um, uh, it hap what happens is that there is excess mucus in the airways, which uh, result in frequent coughing, um, and 80 to 90 percent of these causes of COPD are related to smoking. And finally, coronary, for coronary art artery disease, what it does is it thickens the coronary arteries, resulting in decreased blood flow. And this is the most common form of heart disease. For female smokers that are pregnant, there is an increased risk of spontaneous miscarriage, low birth weight, placental abruption, 
fetal heart defects, sudden infant, infant death syndrome, and premature delivery. Now, uh, there are more than 500,000 cases of head and neck cancer diagnosed annually, and smoking one pack a day increases the risk of head and neck cancers 11-fold. If uh, someone is smoking two packs a day, their risk just increased by 25 times that of a non-smoker. Uh, the skin, it has horrible effects on the skin. So the, the chemicals in tobacco smoke actually destroy collagen and elastin in the skin. And this causes uh, the skin to have decreased elasticity. Um, there is an increase in the aging process. That says again, but it should say aging. And it intensifies skin diseases like skin cancer. And the damage from smoking is irreversible. This is a great uh, video that I found to tell us a little bit more about um, how cigarettes affect the body. Cigarettes aren't good for us. That's hardly news. We've known about the dangers of smoking for decades. But how exactly do cigarettes harm us? Let's look at what happens as their ingredients <coughs> make their way through our bodies and how we benefit physically when we finally give up smoking. With each inhalation, smoke brings its more than 5,000 chemical substances into contact with the body's tissues. From the start, tar, a black resinous material, begins to coat the teeth and gums, damaging tooth enamel and eventually causing decay. Over time, smoke also damages nerve endings in the nose, causing loss of smell. Inside the airways and lungs, smoke increases the likelihood of infections, as well as chronic diseases like bronchitis and emphysema. It does this by damaging the cilia, tiny hair-like structures whose job it is to keep the airways clean. It then fills the alveoli, tiny air sacs that enable the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and blood. A toxic gas called carbon monoxide crosses that membrane into the blood, binding to hemoglobin and displacing the oxygen it would usually have transported around the body. That's one of the reasons smoking can lead to oxygen deprivation and shortness of breath. Within about 10 seconds, the bloodstream carries a stimulant called nicotine to the brain, triggering the release of dopamine and other neurotransmitters including endorphins that create the pleasurable sensations which make smoking highly addictive. Nicotine and other chemicals from the cigarette simultaneously cause constriction of blood vessels and damage their delicate endothelial lining, restricting blood flow. These vascular effects lead to thickening of blood vessel walls and enhance blood platelet stickiness increasing the likelihood that clots will form and trigger heart attacks and strokes. Many of the chemicals inside cigarettes can trigger dangerous mutations in the body's DNA that make cancers form. Additionally, ingredients like arsenic and nickel may disrupt the process of DNA repair, thus compromising the body's ability to fight many cancers. In fact, about one of every three cancer deaths in the United States is caused by smoking. And it's not just lung cancer. Smoking can cause cancer in multiple tissues and organs, as well as damaged eyesight and weakened bones. It makes it harder for women to get pregnant, and in men, it can cause erectile dysfunction. But for those who quit smoking, there's a huge positive upside with almost immediate and long-lasting physical benefits. Just 20 minutes after a smoker's final cigarette, their heart rate and blood pressure begin to return to normal. After 12 hours, carbon monoxide levels stabilize, increasing the blood's oxygen-carrying capacity. A day after ceasing, heart attack risk begins to decrease as blood pressure and heart rates normalize. After two days, the nerve endings responsible for smell and taste start to recover. Lungs become healthier after about one month with less coughing and shortness of breath. The delicate, hair-like cilia in the airways and lungs start recovering within weeks and are restored after nine months, improving resistance to infection. By the one-year anniversary of quitting, heart disease risk plummets to half as blood vessel function improves. Five years in, the chance of a clot forming dramatically declines and the risk of stroke continues to reduce. After 10 years, the chances of developing fatal lung cancer go down by 50% probably because the body's ability to repair DNA is once again restored. 
Fifteen years in, the likelihood of developing coronary heart disease is essentially the same as that of a non-smoker. There's no point pretending this is all easy to achieve. Quitting can lead to anxiety and depression, resulting from nicotine withdrawal. But fortunately, such effects are usually temporary, and quitting is getting easier, thanks to a growing arsenal of tools. Nicotine replacement therapy through gum, skin patches, lozenges and sprays may help wean smokers off cigarettes. They work by stimulating nicotine receptors in the brain and thus preventing withdrawal symptoms without the addition of other harmful chemicals. Counseling and support groups, cognitive behavioral therapy and moderate intensity exercise also help smokers stay cigarette free. That's good news, since quitting puts you and your body on the path back to health. If you want to see more videos on building healthy habits, check out this playlist. Okay, so um, the video also uh, shows you that it's never too late to quit. Um, and this is kind of the idea that you want to encourage your patients to understand because sometimes people feel like, you know, okay, it's not going to make a difference. I've been smoking for so long. Um, but there are uh, very significant effects no matter how old you are. Um, so it's never too late to quit. Uh, now we're going to talk about secondhand smoke, um, which is the smoke that uh, um, non-smokers are inhaling. Uh, it's the term used for tobacco smoke that is exhaled by smokers or is produced by a lighted cigarette, pipe, or cigar. And it essentially contains all of the same harmful chemicals that smokers inhale. In 2006, there was a report by the Surgeon General um, that claimed that there is no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Uh, and nearly half of all non-smoking Americans are exposed to secondhand smoke. Uh, it increases... Uh, secondhand smoke exposure causes disease and premature death in non-smokers. Exposure of adults to secondhand smoke has immediate adverse effects on the cardiovascular system, causing coronary heart disease and lung cancer. Again, this is for, sec for those who are non-smokers. So there is a risk of uh, coronary heart disease and also lung cancer, 25 to 30% increased risk of heart disease and 20 to 30% increased risk of lung cancer by inhaling secondary smoke. And children exposed to secondhand smoke are at an increased risk for sudden infant death syndrome, acute respiratory infections, ear problems, increased severity of asthma, respiratory symptoms, and slowed lung growth. And here uh, we have tooth decay. And I was so happy to see that listed there because I hardly ever see um, tooth decay in children listed as a... Uh, um, consequence of secondhand smoke. Um, hard to find information on tooth decay, so I don't have exact specific numbers for you, but in fact, tooth decay in children is increased uh, if they are exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, and then also it gets in our um, animals, in our doggies and our cats and our birds or whatever kind of animals we have in our homes. Uh, the smoke gets inhaled and trapped in the animal's fur. Dogs in smoking households have a 60% greater risk of lung cancer. The cats are three times more likely to develop lymphoma. At the very least, this is just a few of the facts. And, um, and it's been uh, secondhand smoke has been associated with lung cancer in birds as well. Now, thirdhand smoke is defined as residual nicotine and other chemicals left on a variety of indoor surfaces, such as clothes, furniture, drapes, um, carpets, bedding, um, so this is just smoke, uh, secondhand smoke that now has settled indoors on various um, surface, on various, on various indoor surfaces. It's a serious health concern. Infants, children, and non-smoking adults are at risk for tobacco-related health problems from coming into contact with third-hand smoke-containing surfaces. And you cannot eliminate um, the smoke. Once the smoke has been absorbed into these surfaces, you cannot eliminate in, eliminate it by opening uh, the windows and using fans or, or by trying to air out the room. It, it does not get rid of it. So the only way to protect non-smokers from third-hand smoke is to create a completely smoke-free environment. Uh, so electronic cigarettes are battery-powered devices that provide nicotine and other additives in an aerosol form. So these are called e-cigarettes and uh, when you're smoking an e-cigarette it's called vaping. They are currently unregulated by the FDA, so there are, are no rules as to the, the amounts and types of uh, chemicals that are actually put into those um, e-cigs. So in other words, we have no way to tell what is actually in them. But early studies do show that they contain hazardous chemicals, 
and some countries have banned the sale of e-cigarettes, okay? Now, some people think that e-cigarettes are safer than um, smoking an actual tobacco uh, product, but, um, uh, and they have been, actually the truth is that they have been uh, good tools for people who have tried to quit smoking, have um, used e-cigarettes and that has helped them with their withdrawal symptoms. But um, the issue here is, is that young children are starting to use e-cigarettes and they're uh, developing this habit because obviously uh, e-cigs have nicotine in them. And uh, so now it's like, uh, you know, we, we began a whole generation of addicts. We just gave them a different product, okay? Uh, so now we're going to talk about hookah, um, which are also known as water pipes. Um, and it's a large water pipe used to smoke flavored tobacco. In the right here, I have a picture of uh, what a hookah looks like. At the very, very top is the bowl. Um, is the bowl. It's called a bowl. And then uh, if you look to the right, you see that it says a tray. And that's where you catch all the ash um, coming from the the charcoals that are used to, uh, to heat up the tobacco. You have the stem, if you look at the left-hand side, the third thing down on the left-hand side, the third item uh, says the stem, and that connects the, the tobacco that is in the bowl um, all the way down with the water that is in the vase, okay? So if you go all the way down, the second from the bottom, uh, the second item from the bottom shows you the vase, and that is the, where the wa water is contained. And at the very bottom, we have the hose, which is where the smoker inhales. Um, where the smoker inhales. So the vase is filled with water um, and you submerge the down stem. The bowl is then covered with a perforated foil sheet or metal screen and then hot coals, like, like literally charcoals, a uh, little, you know, if you imagine a charcoal, what charcoal um, briquettes look like, uh, just imagine them a little bit smaller. So that charcoal is literally placed on that bowl head and it causes the, the tobacco in the bowl to heat up and smoke. Uh, sucking through the hose draws more heat on the tobacco and helps to accelerate the heat transfer. By sucking on the hose, the smoke is drawn down through the stem and under the water. The smoke then rises up above the water into the vase and into the hose port, which leads to the smoker's mouth. While many hookah smokers may think this practice is less harmful than smoking cigarettes, hookah smoking has many of the same health risks as cigarette smoking. It delivers the same highly addictive drug found in other uh, tobacco products, namely nicotine, and the tobacco in hookah is exposed to high heat from the burning charcoal, and the smoke is at least as toxic as cigarette smoke. Now, because of the way a hookah is used, smokers may absorb more of the toxic substances also found in cigarette smokes. And this has to do with um, hookah smoking being a very social kind of activity. And an, an hour, like, like a sessions, they call, they're called hookah sessions, can be about as long as an hour. And um, that involves 200, like 200 puffs. Like you could puff on the hookah like 200 times in that an hour. And um, an average cigarette only takes about 20 puffs to complete. So there is incredible potential here to, to really overdo it um, and inhale much more smoke uh, than you would if you use a cigarette. So hookah smokers are at risk for some of the same diseases as cigarette smokers, including cancers and reduced lung function and decreased uh, fertility. It is false that the water removes the harmful chemicals from the tobacco smoke. In fact, there are still high levels of toxins present in the hookah smoke. And then we have um, smokeless tobacco, which is any tobacco that is not smoked but used in another form. And it usually contains more nicotine than cigarettes. Most, most smokeless tobacco involves placing the product between the gum and the cheek or the lip. Smokeless tobacco is non-combustible, so obviously no one is, uh, putting this, is lighting this up. There are two main types of smoking tobacco uh, sold here in the United States, and it's called uh, snuff. Uh, and also SNUS, S-N-U-S. Uh, chewing tobacco is cured tobacco in the form of loose leaf, plug, or twist. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, increased risk for cancers of the pancreas, heart disease, and stroke. Um, because you are pay uh, the people are placing this tobacco product in the vestibule, you'll see a more gingival recession, and also there's a greater risk of uh, the exposed root surfaces decaying. I have a picture of it here. So these are the um, oral effects of smokeless tobacco. Picture A is showing you um, the decayed teeth and also some t soft tissue changes. And picture B obviously is showing you uh, hyperkeratosis of somebody who has placed that tobacco there for quite a while. 
Um, this is an image from Wilkins' textbook. Uh, it's chapter 32 in Wilkins is the tobacco cessation chapter, and uh, these are the oral consequences of tobacco use. We know about cancer and precancer, uh, the periodontal factors I'm going to talk to you about in a second, the soft tissue problems, the soft tissue um, uh, pathologies that you will see connected to smoking are nicotine stomatitis, smoker's melanosis, black hairy tongue, median rhomboiglossitis, leukoedema, and hyperkeratosis. We have um, covered all of these in oral pathology, so you should be aware of what all of those are. And if you're not, go back to those chapters, okay, in the textbook, because uh, we've covered all that. And then uh, dry socket refers to, uh, obviously smoking uh, does not cause a dry socket, you know, uh, a tooth has to be extracted in order for a dry socket to develop. But uh, smoking is implicated in the uh, formation of dry sockets because what happens is, is that uh, after you have a tooth extracted, the clot has to form and smokers have known, been known to kind of dislodge that clot. And when they dislodge the clot, that's when the bone becomes exposed and that's when you have a dry socket. Uh, and of course, delayed wound healing is a um, huge hallmark of um, smoking because what smoking does is it hampers the inflammatory response. So if you don't have a healthy, strong inflammatory response, then um, uh, you're going to get delayed wound healing. Um, some of the heart tissue problems that we see with smoking is uh, incisal abrasion, occlusal or incisal abrasion, uh, and cervical abrasion as well. Dehiscence of bone is very, very rare, very rare. And, uh, but we do see uh, increased incidence of tooth loss, which is connected to its effects on the periodontium, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Some of the aesthetic factors that we will see, aesthetic refers to something that you can see what somebody looks like. Um, halitosis is not something that you see, but uh, you, know, you know what halitosis is. Um, but of course, we'll see dental stains. The teeth will become, will get like an overall kind of yellow tinge, and they'll have also uh, darker brown staining. And it will also stain uh, prostheses and orthodontic appliances and restorations as well. And there will be impaired taste and smell. And it will, smoking will, I'm sorry, tobacco use will exacerbate the um, progression of HIV into AIDS and also the consequences of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So smoking in the periodontium. Smokers are four times more likely to have periodontal disease and 12 to times more likely to exhibit bone loss than non-smokers. They will have more loose teeth and lose more of their teeth. Gingival inflammation and bleeding, bleeding on prom probing will actually be reduced or absent in smokers. Again, smoking uh, induces a, a hampered uh, inflammatory response. That means that smoking um, um, damages the inflammatory response. And if you have a damage in the inflammatory response, uh, that's what accounts for the delayed wound healing. Okay, so the, if you have a uh, reduced inflammatory response and periodontitis, you're going to see less bleeding, less gingival inflammation, and no bleeding on palm probing. And this is what delayed wound healing looks like. So this is uh, a lack of the uh, inflammatory cells, the neutrophils and the other inflammatory cells to do what they need to do in, and heal these tissues. Periodontal health does improve with smoking cessation, and that's why the American Academy of Periodontology recommends tobacco cessation counseling as part of periodontal um, therapy, as part of the non-surgical periodontal therapy. And we do have some clinical practice guidelines for treating tobacco use and dependence that was established by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And what's uh, contained in there, it's um, strategies and recommendations to help clinicians, to help you guys, dental hygienists and dentists, in discussing tobacco cessation with your patients. Tobacco, cessation, uh, tobacco dependence is a chronic condition and it requires repeated intervention. Um, this is one of the, one of the things, as, as we get into the tobacco cessation um, uh, protocols that you have to follow, is that um, you'll learn that you have to, uh, it's such a difficult addiction to break that people that um, are trying to, uh, to stop this habit um, will have to be reminded over and over and they'll have to be supported over and over. That's the word I'm looking for. Lots of support for these people. Um, if a patient is willing to quit, they should be provided with treatments from the guidelines. And if a patient is unwilling to quit, they should be give, still be given a brief intervention to discuss their motivation to quit. Now, a brief intervention can be even an intervention that is as long as three minutes, um, that, you know, less than three minutes. 
can um, can be helpful for a patient. So th this has this has been studied extensively, and so you're encouraged that even if you only spend, if you, even if you only have three minutes, that you can at least uh, make a dent, and you could at least uh, uh, somehow illustrate how important it is for you, um, illustrate how important it is for the patient to uh, to stop smoking. Uh, dental hygienists are one of the most accessible healthcare providers. Uh, the more intensive the intervention, the higher the quit rate. Uh, even minimal interventions, like I said, even three, talking to somebody on three minutes for three minutes can increase the number of users who quit. And the American Dental Association has research that shows that half of all smokers visit the dentist um, annually and that 75% of these patients indicate a willingness to hear advice on quitting. So your patients are not going to be mad at you and they're not going to be sensitive and they're not going to be annoyed. Okay, the worst that will happen is, is that they'll say no and you'll provide a very quick um, uh, discussion about what um, smoking does to teeth or what smoking does to the periodontium or even more importantly, what smoking does to the heart. Uh, and even if you just give that little bit of information, um, it will help in the long run for these patients. And that's why it says in the textbook that tobacco use is considered the fifth vital sign, meaning that this is one of the um, essential bits of information. Smoking is so harmful to the human body that uh, it's considered um, knowledge of, of, of it. If, if people are smoking, um, it can have such an effect in their health that uh, we need to consider it a fifth vital sign, just like we would consider blood pressure a very important piece of information about our patient's health. Uh, if a patient reports that they're smoking, it is so important that it is considered the fifth vital sign. And it's difficult because withdrawing that nicotine is, is like we said, very addictive and uh, withdrawal symptoms are very severe. So you can have uh, for sure anxiety, irritability, depression, difficulty concentrating, all of these um, psycho, psychological effects are very, very strong and very powerful. It's a constant craving for the cigarettes. Um, all this depression and anxiety can deal to insomnia. Um, and, you know, for, for the first few days, you're really out of sorts. So these people are extremely um, uncomfortable is, is the word for it. And so there's a model. It's a five A's model for tobacco cessation, which you'll find on page 360 in your um, Gehrig textbook. Um, um, I'm sorry, I just got a message I should... Um, and the five, A's model the five A's model involves these five steps. Ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. Uh, so the ask portion uh, refers to asking every patient if they um, uh, use tobacco. The advise portion includes um, uh, asking, uh, advise and assess is um, figuring out if a patient would like to quit. Assist is if they want to quit, that you are going to refer them to quit lines, and the arrange portion of the 5 A's approach is um, also related to, uh, once again, repeatedly being on top of the patient and uh, because they need this kind of support. They need very active support. So this is a flow chart that I got from your Wilkins textbook from page 32, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 32 of your Wilkins textbook. And it's, um, I like flow charts. Um, you guys know that I like the colors and everything. I need that. So um, here we have a flow chart. And at the upper left, you see this oval purple. Um, uh, that's where we're going to start. That's our starting point. So at each dental visit, you're going to ask patients about tobacco use. And uh, if you follow the arrows going down, you'll see that if a patient reports that they were a former user or that they never used tobacco, then all you need to do is just praise them at each visit. Congratulate them, and there's nothing else that you need to do. But if they're a current user, the next step is to advise. And the advise portion is going to really uh, involve you discussing the negative effects of tobacco smoking uh, on systemic health, not just oral health, but systemic health. The next portion after that, the next step after that is to assess, and you're going to assess their willingness to quit. And here now you can go one of two ways. The patient can either say, yes, I would like to quit, or the patient will say, uh, no, I'm not interested in quitting. So now if the patient says that they know, that if a patient reports that, no, they're not interested in quitting at this point, then um, uh, you are to provide motivation to quit. So this is this business of motivational interviewing. Now, motivational interviewing is a very effective cognitive behavior therapy approach, and um, they've used motivational interviewing for all kinds of uh, behavior change. 
uh, addictions, weight loss, uh, uh, careers. Lots of leadership programs talk about um, uh, uh, motivational interviewing. This is like hardcore counseling, right? And so the idea behind motivational interviewing is not that you're going to tell your patient what to do. Um, we don't see behavior change happen when we tell people what to do. Right now, if you're a parent, just, just, just picture your child, right? Do they ever listen? They don't listen. With all your heart and with all your affection and love that you have for your children and you're trying to guide them and show them and they don't listen, okay? Because in fact, people will not do what you tell them to do. And so motivational interviewing is really focused around getting the person to understand what it is that they want to do. So you're not supposed to stand there and say to them, you're going to quit smoking. Smoking is not good for you. You're going to quit smoking on Friday and that's going to be the end of it. Okay. You, you can't do that. I mean, I'm being very dramatic, but even, even telling a patient, you know, you should, you, you should stop smoking, um, is not part of motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing looks more like saying to a patient, are you aware of the effects of smoking on your body? Are you aware of the effects of smoking uh, in your mouth, or what it does to your skin? Um, do you like those effects? Okay. Some people are at a point in their lives that they, they don't even care. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, that's what motivational interviewing looks like. And it's a very kind of off hands approach, meaning that you don't want to put pressure on the person to do anything. You, what you want, the, the point of motivational interviewing is to get the person to uh, understand what it is that they want to do with their own bodies. And, and the idea behind that is, is that nobody is ever going to change any behavior until they really understand that the behavior is negative and that it's not helping them. And, and that, that's, a, that's like a life law. That's like a life rule. That's not a tobacco cessation rule. So motivational interviewing is very nice. It's very interesting. But uh, engaging in a motivational interview is very extensive. So right now you can go ahead and picture, you know, any movie that you've seen where you've seen like a therapist talking to the, to the client and you'll see that a good therapist is not supposed to tell the client what's wrong with them, quote unquote, what's wrong with them. It's up to the therapist to gently guide the client to understand for themselves what it is that's wrong. And so that's very time consuming. So if your patient does not want to quit, you are to engage in a, in, in a however brief, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, however long you can talk to them, kind of just giving them information and kind of um, getting them to understand what it is that smoking is doing to them. And then if you can get them to, to actually admit that that is not a healthy approach, the chances of them quitting at some point just went up. Now, if your patient does report that they do want to, oh, I do have a pointer, I just realized that. Uh, now, if your patient reports that they do want to quit, now you're going to go into the assist and arrange portions of uh, tobacco cessation counseling. So with assisting, what you're doing is providing the services for the patient. So this is going, this stage looks a little bit different for us at Hostos than it would look for you in private practice. In private practice, there are actually medications that we can recommend for our patients. I'm going to talk up to you about the medications in one second. Um, and so uh, obviously hygienists cannot prescribe the medications. And so they talk about how the dental team is in charge of tobacco cessation uh, because here the dentist will need to step in and actually um, uh, write the prescription for the medications if uh, that dentist feels that those medications, uh, if the dentist and the patient feel that the, um, medica those medications are the way to go, the, the, the treatment that the patient wants to um, adopt or engage in or do. And then the next step of, of that approach is to set a quit date. And setting a quit date is a very uh, important part of this whole tobacco cessation thing because it's an action-oriented uh, step. Right? All these other steps just involve us talking, blah, 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 but now you have an action connected to it. And then uh, the next step of this now is to provide counseling and supplemental materials, more motivational interviewing. And all of this uh, uh, support can be given in person by telephone or email. So if you look at this uh, uh, arrange uh, step, um, you'll see all those uh, listed there. So uh, that is technically uh, what a tobacco cessation um, counseling uh, should look like in private practice, but we cannot do that here at Hostos. Um, we have a different approach. Well, it's actually very similar. I'll go over that in one second, but first I want to go over the pharmacotherapies. And pharmacotherapies just refers to medications that are used to help people stop smoking. And I put it all in one slide 
I know it seems like a lot of information. I'm sure Dr. Dinsa will review this with you um, a little bit more in depth, uh, what these medications actually do. But for us, I kind of just wanted you to know what they are. Um, they are prescription medications. You cannot get them over the counter. So um, uh, the dentist will have to prescribe these medications. And I really feel that, uh, you know, when we talk about New York State quits, I'm going to... Um, well, let's just talk about medications now. Okay, so the medications are uh, essentially bupropion, varenicline, and uh, some new um, uh, second-line medications called clonidine and nortriptyline. So bupro bupropion was the first uh, non-nicotine medication shown to be effective for tobacco cessation uh, that was approved by the FDA. Its mechanism is its mechanism of action is that it blocks the neural uptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. And it can be used in combination with nicotine replacement therapies, not effect, but it's not affected for those less than 20 years of age. Varenicline was the second one approved by the FDA, and its mechanism of action is that it works as a partial nicotine agonist. It blocks the nicotine's receptors in the brain. And then it also causes reduction in dopamine release. So the, the idea here is, is that the uh, nicotine will not have the effects on the brain that it used to have. And by reducing those effects, by reducing those, uh, uh, yeah, by reducing those effects, the person will get over their uh, addiction to nicotine. Um, it's not currently uh, recommended for use in combination with nicotine replacement ter therapies. Forgive me, that should say NRT, not NTRs. So nicotine replacement therapies, I'm going to talk about in the next slide. I'll, I'll show you what that re replace, uh, refers to. These therapies are not related to nicotine, okay? Uh, nicotine replacement therapies are um, therapies that kind of give the patient that, that hit of nicotine that they need without the uh, chemicals that are causing all these uh, negative effects in tobacco, right? These therapies do not have to do with nicotine. They actually are... Uh, 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 receptors, they block the receptors in the brain for nicotine and reduce the effects of the nicotine. And then we have some combination therapies, which means that we can use some nicotine replacement therapies with the um, non-nicotine replacement therapies, and they're called combination therapies. So here you'll see that uh, a nicotine patch can be used with a nicotine gum or spray, or you can use an inhaler with the patch, or you can use bupropion with the patch. And then we have some second line medications that have not been approved by the FDA um, as a tobacco dependence treatment um, protocol, and they're called clonidine and nortriptyline. Okay, and uh, your textbook says that they can be considered for use on a case by case basis after first line treatments have been used and obviously did not work. And we do have some uh, positive um, effects of uh, acupuncture and hypnotherapy uh, with those who uh, want to stop smoking and. Um, and they're actually very effective. Uh, acupuncture and hypnotherapy have actually had some really good success in helping people overcome this addiction. Uh, so we have quit lines. Don't I have my... Okay. I, I don't have a slide to talk to you about nicotine replacement therapy, so I'll just briefly talk about that. So nicotine replacement therapies, again, are um, uh, 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 therapies... Um, that are used uh, to stop smoking that involve uh, replacing the nicotine because the person is addicted to the nicotine. They're not addicted to the cancer-causing smoke and they're not addicted to the, you know, the other stuff. They're really addicted to the nicotine. So we have some um, uh, items, let's call them items, that can um, uh, give the person nicotine, give the person the nicotine that they're craving. And uh, so we have the patch and you have gum. You also have a spray. Um, a nasal spray, and what was the other one? And the inhaler, a nicotine inhaler. And um, those are, are over the counter. You don't need a prescription for those. And so those will be used as we talked about the quit lines. We're going to start talking about those a little bit more. So the quit lines have been shown to be extremely effective in helping people to quit smoking. Um, uh, quit line use more than triples a person's success in quitting. Um, these quit lines are staffed by trained smoking cessation experts. And when, when, uh, when we say trained, I, I really mean trained. Like you have to like go and, and it's not like a, a, you know, a, a three hour training or something. They actually are, are trained on behavioral approaches. They're trained on the effects of the medications. They're trained on how to deal with people that are in the throes of an addiction. It's a, 
a really wonderful thing. You can become a tobacco cessation um, counselor uh, in New York. So if you go to the NY Quits website, they give you information on that as well. Uh, it only takes you 30 seconds to refer someone to a quit line, and I have some quit line numbers there. And the one that we're going to be using is this 1866 NY Quits, okay, for New Yorkers. Um, most relapses occur in the first few months of a quit attempt. Half of all smokers eventually quit, but those who go at it alone with no help from anybody only have a 2 to 4% chance of uh, succeeding. So uh, nicotine replacement therapies, quit lines, support are very effective in um, helping people to stop smoking. Um, most smokers make 11, I said that, and hygienists play a key role in helping the tobacco users through several quit attempts before a successful one. And here is the form that you're going to be using at Hostos. So um, it's called a tobacco use assessment form. So at Hostos, if you have someone who reports, because you're going to be asking every single patient if they smoke, and uh, if the patient reports that yes, they do smoke, you will now be um, using this tobacco use assessment form. And you're just gonna answer all those questions in the front, and if you flip it to the back, and I'm sorry, I don't have um, an image of the back, but at the back of this form, what it has is just, um, it's called tobacco cessation progress notes, so that at every subsequent visit, you're going to update what it was that, um, first of all, if there's any oral findings related to the tobacco use, and uh, if there's any changes, so that if you, whatever you spoke to the patient about the first visit, you're going to follow up in the second visit and the, the subsequent visits after that. Okay? So this is the process for hostos. For every single patient that you see, you must ask them if they smoke. If they report they don't smoke, you know what to do. I'm actually going to go to my little flow chart here in a second. Um, if they say that they don't smoke, you just congratulate them. But if they say they do smoke, now you have to fill out this form. Okay? And... Uh, if the patient reports, I'm going to go to my flow chart, okay? So now here we are. At each dental visit, you're going to ask the patient if they smoke. Um, and if they say no, you just praise them. If they say yes, then you're going to begin your advise and assess um, portions of the five A's approach. And uh, you're going to assess your patient's willingness to quit. Your patient can tell you one of two things. They can say no, I don't want to quit, in which time you are to engage in at least at least a couple of minutes worth of an intervention advising the patient of the effects of smoking. Of course, all of this must be written in the progress notes. Now, if the patient reports that yes, they, they would like some help uh, to quit smoking, what you're going to do is fill out the New York State Smokers Quit Line form. I'm sorry, New York State Smokers Quit Line Facts to Quit form. And that form looks like this. Now, the tobacco use assessment form and the uh, facts to quit referral form are in the back of clinic. So if your patient reports that they do want to quit smoking, you will have to fill out this whole entire form, okay? And after you have filled out the form, you are to give it to someone at our front desk. So you're going to give it to one of the college assistants, and they will fax it to uh, New, York, um, New York State Smokers Quit Line, or you can give it to Ms. Brown and she will fax it to the New York State Smokers Quit Line. And once that has been faxed over, somebody from New York State uh, Smokers Quit Line will contact the patient and they will get the care that they need. They will get the assistance that they need, okay? So once again, oh, and this is, uh, uh, the back of the form is, is in Spanish. The front of this form is in English and the back of the form is in Spanish. So one more time, because it's important that you understand this protocol. If a patient comes into your, if one of your patients uh, comes in, actually, let me back up one more step. Every single patient that comes in, you must be asking them if they smoke. If they report that they don't smoke, you are to congratulate them. Uh, um, the next scenario is that the patient uh, reports that they do smoke. If they do smoke, you are to engage into the advise and assess portion of the five A's approach. Uh, Part of the assess portion means that you will ask your patient if they want to quit or not. If they don't want to quit, then you will engage in at least uh, some kind of intervention um, discussing the effects of smoking and, and at least letting the patient know that there are some negative uh, effects of smoking. If they do want to quit, then you need to fill out the New York State Smokers Quit Line Facts to Quit form and give that to one of the uh, ladies at the front desk uh, to either one of the college assistants or to Ms. Brown. 
Now this arrange for follow-up, you don't really have to arrange for follow-up, but every single time that the patient comes back, you need to update. On the back of the tobacco use assessment form, you need to update um, how the patient has come along in that process, okay? And um, uh, you see the arrows that kind of lead to us so that uh, if, let's say your patient uh, did want to quit, let's say they did go, uh, you, you, you filled out the form, the facts to quit form, and the patient got all, all the help they needed, and one of two things can happen. The patient either relapsed and uh, went back to smoking, in which case you're back to uh, the second portion, which is to advise them to quit, or the patient was abstinent, they were successful in their attempts, and now you're going to, um, they're going to be one of these former users, and um, now you'll just praise them at every single visit. Okay, and that's the end of our presentation.